today. And I'm really excited to be kicking off this first panel discussion that we have on strategies to address the digital divide. Um, so I'm joined by our esteemed panelists, uh, Jessica Rosenworcel, who is the acting chairwoman of the Federal Communications Commission. Congratulations. Um, she believes that the future belongs to those who are connected. I, I tend to agree with her. She also has been working at the FCC to promote greater opportunity for accessibility and affordability in our communication services in order to ensure that all Americans get a fair shot at the 21st century opportunities and success. Thank you, Jessica, for joining today. We've also got uh, Tony Tijerina, who is president and CEO of Hispanic Federation, Hispanic <laughs> Heritage Foundation. Sorry, it just rolls off the tongue nowadays. Um, a national nonprofit focused on- Did you just offer me a job, bro? Yeah, you're, you're always welcome to come up north, Tony. So. <laughs> um, so he he's he's of course with the Hispanic Heritage Foundation, a national nonprofit focused on education, workforce, social impact, and culture through innovation and leadership. HHF is really acknowledged as a creative, agile, impact focused organization, which has been recognized by both the White House, uh, the Congress, Fortune 500 companies, other nonprofits. And my favorite recognition was Tony received the Otley Award from the Mexican government, which is the highest award honored uh, for a uh, U.S. citizen. So congratulations, Tony, on that award. And Diego Daler Snyder is the senior research manager at the Aspen Institute for Latinos and Society program. Based in New York City, he leads the Latino Digital Inclusion Initiative, which aims at identifying, developing, and uplifting promising ecosystem approaches that better prepare Latinos to compete in a 21st century digital economy. And he is a Fulbright scholar, something that I've always admired. So we're really delighted to have him on the panel with us today as well. So um, I wanted to give each of you uh, really a chance to give some opening remarks. And if it's okay, Jessica, I'd like to start with you. Well, thank you so much, Brent, for having me here today. And it's terrific to be here with my friend Tony, and it's wonderful to meet Diego, too. <laughs> um, like you said, I believe the future belongs to the connected. I think broadband is the infrastructure challenge of our day. And the challenge for all of us is to identify how we get 100% of our households, businesses, and communities connected to high-speed service. This pandemic has proven like nothing before that broadband is no longer nice to have. It's need to have for everyone everywhere, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter where you came from. And so when I think about the Federal Communications Commission and its mission right now, front of mind and top of mind is figuring out how we make sure every household in this country gets connected to high speed service. That's for school, online class, it's for healthcare, for entertainment, it's for work, and it's for creating. And I don't think we're going to see the full genius of this country make its way into civic and commercial life without making sure that the Latino population is fully participating in that creation and fully connected. We've got new big programs at the FCC to help get households connected, particularly if they're low income or been struggling during this pandemic. One of those programs I hope we can talk some more about is the emergency broadband benefit. And I want to make sure that we get the word out about these programs, that we help households, Spanish speaking households across the country, find ways to get online, create online and fully participate in modern life and our modern economy. And um, I am thrilled to be here today to talk about that some more. And uh, in the interest of brevity, I will leave it at that and uh, pass it back to you, Brent. Thank you, Jessica. You're always so inspiring, um, and we're so happy to have you there leading leading the commissioner. commission. It's uh, incredible to have such an ally in this effort um, there at the commission, so thank you. Um, Tony, um, you've been the guy I always turn to when I have questions about how can we best help our community um, address the digital divide and help ensure that our folks are getting opportunity in the digital workspace. Can you tell us a, a bit about your efforts in this this regard? Thank you, Brent. The only reason you would call me is because uh, Jessica was busy at that moment, because otherwise <laughs> you should definitely call her first and now Diego. But um, yeah, I, I just think it's everything Jessica said is 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 clearly been um, exacerbated um, in terms of what's happened over the last 10 years and especially over the last year. I, I wrote an article that said that there's no vaccine for the for the um, equity 
crisis in terms of tech equity crisis that, that we faced in 2020. And with five out of six Latinos not being able to work from home, um, their, their young people were still at home. And then you also have a lot of folks that um, need to shift in terms of this, this is a great restart in 2021 to be able to shift in career paths. And but it all is dependent on access to technology. And, and that's why I think Jessica's comment that the future belongs to those that are connected is exactly right, especially with seven out of 10 new jobs over the next 10 years that will be filled by Latinos. It's important to get them connected. Um, the, the other thing that I think is Im, Im, important to talk about is that you have inherent skills that are coming f- from immigrants from other countries that you're bringing to this great country. That is, and, and I was just on a, on a, panel recently, and, and by that I mean just before this one, with Chiki Agu, who is the uh, chief innovation officer at Department of Labor, mm. who is, is an immigrant, and he talked about that, that two out of three of our in our workforce uh, do not have uh, four-year degrees, um, and it's important to not ignore this majority of our workforce that, that we need to make sure are getting the appropriate skills mm-hmm to move forward in the workforce and help our, our economy move forward. Um, and so I, I just think that everything that, that Jessica has been, has been um, talking about for, for the last decade um, is even more important and highlighted right now going forward. And all of us need to be more adaptable to that need. And the last thing I'll say is a sense of urgency. Um, we need to be more impatient with, with this issue. Uh, I, I think you, 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 you Sometimes you're strategizing and having long-term plans, especially in the policy space. And there's a whole lot of folks that are disconnected right now that need to be connected right now, especially after 2020. So I implore everyone that's working with these communities, these disconnected communities, to have more impatience with your activism. Impatient activism is key. It sure is. And it's great to have have your impatience and your activism, Tony, to, to lend to the cause. You've been been a really amazing voice in this area. So thank you. Thank you for that. Great. Diego, so, you know, the Aspen Institute's a real heavyweight in this space and has been um, responsible for a lot of deep thinking about how challenging um, uh, inclusion is in, in the digital space, hoping that you can tell us a little bit about your work and and what your what your focus is. Hello, Brent. Thank you so much for the introduction. And it's, it's uh, really a privilege to be here today in the panel with, with Tony uh, and with mm-hmm. Jessica. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, from the Aspen Institute, uh, we launched the Latino Social Society program in 2015 uh, because we are convinced that uh, the Latino community has a very important role to play in the U.S. economy. Uh, we are already 18% of the workforce of this country. Uh, we contribute to almost 13% of the GDP of this country. Uh, but we also know that Latinos, we over-index in those sectors that are most at risk of job loss due to automation and digitalization, sectors such as agriculture, construction, retail, hospitality. So we believe it's very important to work in digital upskilling, not only for Latino workers, but also for Latino small businesses in these sectors because uh, otherwise there is a big risk of uh, both Latino workers and Latino businesses to be left behind in the 21st century digital economy. So uh, we are currently leading the Latino Digital Inclusion Initiative, which is a research project funded by google.org, in which we are uh, interviewing employers of Latinos in, in these five sectors I mentioned previously, in order to identify what are the digital skill needs that these employers have regarding their workforce, trying to identify as well what kind of initiatives are being implemented in the sectors, uh, what kind of obstacles workers are finding in their way uh, to upskilling, and provide uh, policy recommendations for government officials, but also for firms in those sectors. Uh, In line with what uh, my peers have uh, said in their their introductions before, uh, we believe that Latino digital inclusion is a three-legged tool. Uh, It's very important to work in uh, broadband connectivity, uh, access to devices and uh, digital skills. Uh, we believe that uh, the FCC is doing a great job now with the EBB and the EBB Panami campaign in particular uh, to address the connectivity issue and the access to devices issue. So we are focusing a lot now in the digital skills uh, section of Latino digital inclusion, uh, pretty much in line with the efforts that Tony uh, and the Hispanic Heritage Foundation are leading as well. 
Uh, we strongly believe in ecosystem building. Uh, we believe that the obstacles ahead of us are uh, quite large. And as long as we are able to align our efforts, we are going to be able to move the needle and make uh, or introduce changes uh, into the system that are much needed in order to, to really change the reality of Latino workers and businesses for the better. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I'm sure that research is going to be really helpful to the organizations that are on with us today because they're looking to make sure that they're teaching those digital skill sets that, that the employer is looking for. So that's going to be perfect. Uh, uh, looking forward to engaging you in that discussion. So great. So so before we kind of get into some of the strategies for addressing this, I think I think it's important to really just understand what the principal barriers are to the digital divide. I'm, I'm going to ask the panel to think about you know, what are the principal barriers to Latino inclusion in the digital economy that you've identified? Um, and then we'll get into kind of solutions to address those in the next question. So uh, let anyone kick it off and then we'll, we'll just go around the table. Okay, I'll kick things off because I'm- Thank you, Jessica. Absolutely, right. infrastructure level. And infrastructure, as you know, is a trendy topic in Washington. Mm -hmm. There are- two parts to the digital divide, and both affect Latino communities. The first part we hear a lot about, it's the rural and remote communities where there may not be the infrastructure present to reach every household and to reach everyone everywhere. And much like this nation worked a century ago with rural electrification, we gotta bring that technology to rural and remote and farming communities so that everyone who lives and works there can go online there. That is a lot of the discussion about infrastructure. But it's not the only discussion we need to have because there are three times as many households in urban America and many of them black and brown households that don't have consistent, reliable internet access. And most of the kind, that's because they can't afford it. Or they believe it's not relevant or necessary for a job, for education, for the things they need for modern life. And we are never going to attack this problem and address our digital divide if we don't recognize that we have both a deployment and adoption problem. And that is um, mm. true for every population. And it's especially true um, when it comes to the Latino populations. And when, if we ever have discussions about the digital divide, I wanna make it imperative that we talk both about that rural issue, but also about the fact that we have so many households in urban America that are not connected. And we have to address that too. The Latino population exists in both, just like the rest of the United States population. But we have absolutely gotta talk about both of those things, not one or the other. If, 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 absolutely. I, we have an actual strategy over the entire summer that it's going to be along rural areas um, on the southern border across four states. Um, and the entire strategy is that it's a double whammy. You're Latinx, so you're being hit with the inequity in terms of connecting. And then on top of that, um, you're in a rural area. But we sometimes we're so focused on So thank you for, for mentioning, Jessica, that you, you, it's not in lieu of the urban areas, it, it, it's in addition to, and it's just something to, to, to keep an eye on. Adoption is, is, is also something that I wanna pick up on that you mentioned, um, because it as nonprofits that are working um, on these issues and with our corporate partners that I think are well-meaning in, in, in providing opportunities for, for reduced or, or in some cases free internet access, adoption has to be a programmatic measurement deliverable that we weave it into our, our programmatic deliverables and that they dictate that that's a part of it. That's a way of calling bullshit on somebody that says we want everyone to use the, 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 these resources that we're providing. Okay, then write it into our deliverables that we, part of our, our program, part of our curriculum is helping them get connected through what you're providing. Um, because that has been very helpful for us. I'll give you an example. Um, we're working with T-Mobile, who who's, has a 10 million project where they're providing um, um, the, the hotspots, 10 million hotspots. We are 
designing our, pro our program, our education and workforce programs around where we're able to provide those those uh, mm -hmm. uh, th th those um, um, hotspots. Um, so that way, we're taking advantage of something that one of our partners is offering. And a lot of times there's a disconnect between those two. So I, I, I wanted to mention um, that as well, that, that programmatically we have to in include that part of it. We also just have to be more creative um, with what we're doing. We have to be more adaptable. And again, I, I have things that are being done right now. I remember uh, Jessica giving a speech many years ago talking about how we need to put um, – uh, connectivity on buses as people are going back and forth and in rural areas in, in buses that sometimes these kids are on the bus for an hour and a half or in suburban areas that, that some of our, um, the, the workforce are on these buses going back and forth that, that are adults um, and being able to wire them so that they're able to be connected and, and access job opportunities. And, and, and job opportunities are, are, are online now. Getting vaccinated is online. Um, that this connectivity is, is bigger um, now than ever, especially as we're reaching this critical point. And I just want to mention, too, mental health resources are online right now. And this is something that is a bigger impediment, as big of impediment as the digital divide, um, uh, is battling uh, mental health issues that will allow you to even look for a job. And so we have to be able to address all of these issues at one time. You know, some pretty big challenges. Diego, do you have some thoughts? Yes, um, just to add that basically we also agree that um, citizenship nowadays is also uh, in big part uh, digital. So in order to be fully a citizen and be being able to access services, uh, it is very important to enable the population to, to, to have digital access to them. Uh, I also wanted to um, focus on Latino businesses and how... Uh, Traditionally, Latino businesses have had, uh, have had lower access to, to financing, to capital, to mentorship networks, and also uh, how these limitations have put Latino businesses in disadvantage versus uh, uh, other, other segments of, of the business world. Uh, so in order to fully enable Latino businesses to connect to these opportunities, it's important to improve their, their access to finance uh, because none of these Digital transformations is, uh, is, 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 is for free. Uh, businesses need to invest a lot in order to be able to transition to these digital platforms and tools. So in order to facilitate that, access to capital is key. And then from the perspective of Latino workers, uh, there, there needs to be a very important uh, cultural shift from employers where hiring practices don't focus as much on degrees, but more on potential or skills because otherwise there is a big bias against uh, Latino workers. Lat Latino workers, unfortunately, tend to have lower access to higher education institutions. So um, we know that not always a degree uh, is indicative of uh, a person being able to do a, a job in the right way. So it it's important to also shift the way that companies are choosing their candidates. And taking advantage of our, that's such a great point, Diego. I, I have, I had an uncle and I used to remember walking down the street with him and there would be a broken, um, uh, uh, like, um, toaster that would be sitting on the side of the road and he would pick up that toaster that somebody else was throwing out. Next thing you know, we're using it. He fixed it. Nobody can tell me that that's not problem solving in its greatest way. Though, though that is a skill when people have this, this, uh, this snootiness about what skilled labor is. What I do is not skilled labor. Somebody that can fix a toaster, fix a car, that's skilled labor. Um, so I just want to say that that's, it's just a question of trying to identify how do you transition those skills, those, those inherent skills that are being brought over to this country to move this country forward. And our workforce needs those skills. It's just a question, like Diego said, of finding the place where they can land and giving them the skills um, and the confidence. Let's not forget the confidence um, to be able to do that, and especially English learners. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I I do want to put in a shameless plug, Diego, that um, if some of those businesses that are looking to you know get uh, new digital skills uh, and take advantage of the digital economy um, would like to hire some great employees, we've got fourteen thousand graduates of our program from this year that are uh, been trained, they've got some great digital skill sets and they're looking for workplace opportunities. We placed a lot of them, but we're looking to place some more. So let us know about those businesses. They can contact us and we'll try to connect them to the right folks. So um, 
so this is great. So, so I think that I wanted to go into um, now that we kind of understand some of the challenges. You know, what are what are we found really that are the most effective strategies? Because I think a lot of the um, the organizations are really looking to us for ideas on how they can be as effective as possible at providing this digital skilling. So, what have you found in terms of the work that you're doing that you think is really effective? And Jessica, I'm going to ask you to start off again since. You're our fearless okay. leader. Can you hear but us? I'm going to borrow uh, what Diego <laughs> called the three-part stool, or I like to think of as the holy trinity, okay? Okay. We're going to have to have connectivity. We're going to have to have devices. And we're going to have to have skill opportunities. We need all three of those things. Now, at the FCC, we're trying to help with our infrastructure programs in rural areas and on our emergency broadband benefit which will help households nationwide get up to a $50 discount or even $75 in some locations a month for basic broadband service. That's huge. But we're also going to need to combine that with devices that give people real functionality, not just consumption functionality, but creative functionality. You know, we got to think beyond the mobile phone, which is really a consumption device, not a creation mm -hmm. device. And then I think we've got to work to identify what kinds of digital skill programs are needed in communities everywhere. I'm not going to tell you that the Federal Communications Commission is the place to start that. We're much better when it comes to the networks and connections and even helping try to develop opportunities for devices. But I know that if we don't combine those two things with effective digital skill programs with local trusted institutions, we're going to miss opportunities to truly bring the Latinx community online. And so those are the three things. I think Diego nailed it with his three-part three, uh, three part stool. And I think that's how we should think about these. I think some of them can happen at a federal level, but I really think that skill components, it's dependent on there being trusted actors and institutions in communities, because I think that's where you make the meaningful difference. Fantastic. If, if I could, Brent, I, I think we also need to be very adaptable in doing this um, as the people providing these resources, whether it's government, whether it's think tanks like, like Diego's at, whether it's um, direct service organizations and policy organizations like you guys are and, and we are. Um, I think that it's really important, for instance, I'll give you an example of it. Uh, returning citizens are five times more likely to not be able to get a job. It's, you're also more likely to go back to prison if you don't have a job. So we need to be able to provide something that is adapted to what those needs are specifically, as well as what we need in terms of job creation, taking advantage of natural skills that some might have to, 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 to help them land in a place that will be productive and, and productive for the United States. You know, we, so we have a program called Tech Presarios where we work with Sabio Labs, and they are a boot camp, a place where one would go. To, to go through like a three month course, you leave your job, it's completely um, intensive. And then you have a job at the other end that often can change, uh, that can change uh, generational poverty um, when, you, when you can get some of these jobs. And so th what this program does is that it teaches tech entrepreneurship. So it's divided in terms of learning how to, how to put together websites and, and, and do all kinds of, it's digital skills, but through the lens of entrepreneurship so that they can hire themselves and hire others that are returning citizens and work as consultants. And then we place them as consultants with Latino small businesses and others that have a great need for this kind of work. Um, and, and this is an opportunity for us to be able to lift certain communities while lifting our workforce at the same time. And entrepreneurship is certainly the, the, the best way to not have to wait on someone um, uh, to help you. Yeah, I love how both you and Jessica have talked about this be creators, not just consumers aspect. That's certainly part of this entrepreneurial culture that we have to really, really infuse into our community. So that's fantastic. Diego, did you want to? Sure. To add into this, to add into this um, right now there is a lot of uh, federal funding reaching a lot of communities, either through the FCC with the EBB program, either uh, through funding to CDFIs and minority uh, 
uh, led uh, financing institutions. Uh, the important thing is that uh, in order to build up digital skills in Latino communities, uh, we need to have a very uh, we need to have a local approach to it because the digital skills that are going to be required will be different for different economic systems and to different sectors and to different segments of the population. So we cannot have a, um, a place blind approach to it. And it, in, in this respect, it's very important to build up ecosystems of organizations at the local level. There is a very interesting case that we have been looking into recently. Uh, there is an organization in the Central Valley of California called Digital Nest. They work with um, young adults and teenagers who are still in high school. They provide them teach it, training in digital skills and digital tools. And at the same time, this organization bridges with the local small businesses, many of whom are uh, Latino owned, and they provide consulting services to these um, small businesses in order to successfully transition into digital platforms. So for example, having a website, having um, um, presence in digital uh, e-commerce platforms. So for many of these small businesses, normally it would be very expensive to do so, but this small organi- this, this uh, non-for-profit provide those services for a very affordable price, while at the same time providing um, the teenagers and the young adults the, the tools and the skills that they will require in order to successfully land a job afterwards. Uh, so we think this is a very interesting approach. Uh, in particular, Digital Nest works very closely with the Santa Cruz Small Business Development Corporation uh, at, at, at the city. So um, we think that these kind of uh, alliances have a lot of uh, promise. Um, so yeah, basically uh, that on the one hand, and we also believe that it's very important to start shifting the narrative around Latinos and technology. We think there is a lot of very inspiring stories out there and we need to showcase the Latino talent much more in order to debunk uh, unhelpful myths that uh, prevent gatekeepers and decision makers from giving opportunities to a lot of uh, Latinos out there that uh, are doing great things uh, indeed. That's a great idea, definitely. So. Uh, Jessica, you've been a champion of the addressing the homework gap, which is um, the challenge that many Latino students have when they go home. They don't have a broadband connection in the home, so they often have to go to libraries. Um, you've even talked about people going to McDonald's to try to do homework. Um, and now you have a tool to address this, the um, uh, emergency broadband benefit. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that program and then how can, in, in particular, how can our Latino organizations help you and help our community by um, sending information about this program and helping people to sign up for it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, let me start <laughs> with this by saying everyone's got some image that has stayed with them from the pandemic. Something that just chilled them to the bone. And the one that stays with me is this image of two girls sitting outside of a Taco Bell in Salinas, California. They weren't there for lunch. They had laptops perched on their knees and they were sitting on the cement outside the restaurant because it was the only place they could go to get a Wi-Fi signal to go to class. We had millions of kids just like them locked out of the virtual classroom in this country during the last year because they didn't have consistent and reliable internet access at home. And disproportionate numbers of them or from Latino households. Mm -hmm. I think this homework gap, the situation where you have kids who could get connected in physical buildings, but then don't have the internet access they need at home for online gatherings, class and homework is a national crisis. And it's on us now as we come out of this pandemic to address it. Let's use this crisis to say one more time, no child in this country is going to be left offline, no matter who they are, no matter where they live, no matter who their parents are. We can do that. We can fix it. There are 17 million kids like this in this country, and we are now, for the first time ever, in a position where we actually have programs that can help. There's two of them. The first you heard me talk a lot about, the emergency broadband benefit. If you are from a household, that is on Medicaid, SNAP, you've lost a job in the last year, you can sign up with your broadband provider and get about, most cases, a $50 discount a month to help you get online. And the FCC has a whole toolkit that's in Spanish you can use if you want to borrow it. It's on our website. 
use with communities, make sure the people you know can help those kids, those families get online. The other program we have is called the Emergency Connectivity Fund, and this one mm -hmm. is directed specifically at the homework gap. We have now asked every school and library in this country, do you have students in your community who don't have internet access and can't get online for class, for homework, for schoolwork that fall into this homework gap? Because we want to help you get them out. We now have a 7.17 billion, billion with a B, billion dollar fund for the homework gap at the FCC as a result of the American Rescue Plan and work that advocates like Tony and everyone else have been doing over the years. We drew attention to this crisis, those girls in front of Taco Bell, and we have this fund now. There's a window for applications from schools and libraries between June 29th and August 13th to apply for funds because that $7.17 billion is available to schools and libraries to help get students connected at home if they need it for their education. So we've got this emergency broadband benefit for low income households, households on federal programs, and we've got this emergency connectivity fund for schools and libraries. We have the power to do some really significant good here. Um, and I think that good is going to disproportionately head to the Latino community. And I want to see that we get more of those households and more places connected. And I hope we don't see kids sliding into booths at fast food restaurants and sitting outside like that. Uh, again, it's, I don't know, in the United States, it just feels to me like it should be within our power to connect every child, no matter who they are, or where they live. Yeah, I definitely hear you. If I can just support everything Jessica sure. said, because again, I I applaud her because she's been um, she's been leading this effort and working on this homework gap for so many years before COVID. Um, she saw it as a crisis then, and it's just an, a, a, a a crisis that exploded um, and exposed a lot of the structural problems with it within our. Um, our systems during COVID. But I, I just want to bring up a couple of things that we actually did a study and Latinos were most likely to say that their homework suffered be, uh, because um, their grades suffered and most likely to say they couldn't finish their homework because of access to technology. Teachers that we surveyed in a study that we did with the Student Research Foundation found that teachers said that accessing the parents to be able to communicate with them, which of course everyone knows during COVID, everything was being done by email. The biggest barrier wasn't language. It was actually access to, to, to the internet and access to devices. Um, and do you, everybody remember being latchkey kids? I, I'm old enough to remember that term, right? So that just meant that I came home after eating twice and learning all day to an empty house. Uh, what it means now, is during COVID was that four out of five, or no, it's five out of six Latino um, uh, Latino workers have to work outside of the home. So it meant that you weren't getting fed and you were trying to log on to the internet when it was spotty at best. Um, and I don't know if you guys know, but it, it, there's 3 million kids that Zoomed out during this past school year. 3 million. They can't find them, the school system. They, they, they just stopped zooming in. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a, a bigger example of the homework gap beyond the kids that are sitting um, trying to log on to a restaurant or sitting in a booth. These are kids that just zoomed out um, that we also have to address. And, and look, I have three children. I have a 10 year old, a 13 year old and a 15 year old. Every summer there's a slide in what they learn that they call it the summer slide over summer. Right. They lose 25 percent. Of, of, of what they learned during the school year. And they have to relearn it for the first few months of the next semester. Well, that summer slide just into a year slide that's going to affect our communities for years to come. So when you have the promise of a 15 year old kid with access to the internet and a computer that can reach more people than Gandhi, Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez could in lifetimes combined in a split <laughs> second and they don't have that opportunity, because they aren't connected, um, that is something that, thanks to the leadership of Jessica and 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 the work of Diego and you, Brent, and everyone in Hispanic Federation, that we're able to address those issues and everyone that's on this um, and, and that's on this uh, uh, call as well. Thank you, Tony. Your, your passion speaks volumes, and I think this issue of of the lost year is something we're all going to have to address. Um, you know, beyond this digital discussion, I think it's 
It's definitely one of the biggest harms that's done to our communities, and we've got to help them recover from that. So that's something that uh, we're all in with with you to try to try to um, change. So so let me turn to Diego again. So I, you, you know, there's been um, some some great work that you've done at the the Aspen Institute. How how has the pandemic kind of shifted um, our economy um, from what from your research? Have you been have you been able to kind of study any post pandemic um, type shifts and in particular the workforce? How how does how does this kind of new economic situation um, impacted the opportunity for Latinos to have advancement within the workspace? Sure. So we are cu- currently looking into that. We still don't have any findings to share. But what we can do, we, what, what we can say is that Latino workers uh, had lower possibilities of uh, working from home in comparison to other demographics, and that uh, exposed Latinos to 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 the pandemic much more than other segment, segments of the U.S. population. Uh, we saw that in, in both uh, COVID cases, COVID hospitalizations, and COVID deaths. Unfortunately, many of our uh, Latino workers in frontline positions uh, had to had to carry with most of the burden of the pandemic. Um, and we did see as well that the companies that made investments into IT and technology before the pandemic, of course, were in a better position to 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 weather the storm and to remain as competitive and resilient as uh, as before the the pandemic. So, of course, uh, the possibility of uh, having these investments is is key for any business to survive in the long run. Um, What we think is that now, after the pandemic, we have a unique opportunity ahead of us, uh, since it's very clear the amount of uh, contributions to to the U.S. economy that the Latino uh, community is doing. Um, It's a very unique opportunity to show how it makes sense to to, to, to include the Latino uh, segment in, in the digital economy, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's good for business. Uh, we, we are trying to show uh, corporate America how uh, actually thinking on Latino inclusion is actually good for them and, and, and to, to, to make their businesses uh, grow and to keep them uh, resilient and competitive in the global uh, arena. So uh, that's also one of our focuses. And uh, yeah. That's what I have to share now. This is incredible. Um, so I have actually a lot more questions asked, but I wanted to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. So I'm going to ask the audience to grab the mic here um, to give them a chance to ask some some questions um, of our panel. Um, so is Jessica, are you able to um, see any questions coming coming in? So for I love it, but I'm going to freely admit that I probably need my glasses to do it effectively because, you know, I've reached that age. <laughs> so Fred, <laughs> if you want to moderate because your eyesight's better than mine, you are welcome to do so. Okay, great. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. I met Jessica Guzman. <laughs> uh, oh, Jessica, okay. All right. I think she's going to tell us how to how to how to yeah, uh, well, that's ask the a question. Having two Jessicas in this event, you know, it's, it's always the issue. It's always the issue. <laughs> but for those who are interested in posing a question, there is a microphone feature on the bottom left uh, side of your screen. Feel free to grab that mic, and we can bring you on to the stage to ask your question live. Excellent. I think Karina, were you trying to ask a question? Did we lose her? Let me see if I can invite her here. There we are. Okay, Miss Guzman, I'm having trouble getting Jessica a chance to, or, or Karina a chance to ask a question here. No problem, Karina. If you could just grab the microphone, and we will give you privileges to join us on stage. And this is why technology sometimes is confusing. <laughs> we were just talking about that earlier. You may have to enable your camera, Karina. Okay, now, now Margarita's um, asked to join the mic here. Correct, Margarita, feel free to unmute yourself and to turn on your camera to ask the question. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Social great panel. Thank you so 
much for all the information provided. Uh, my question is, um, we are seeing an increased need for hybrid training opportunities where classes need to be provided in person and remotely. Do you have any advice uh, for how um, organizations can accomplish this objective while you know the limited funding available to us? I, I can weigh in on this one, Brent, since we're Perfect. Same thing and scratching and hustling, just like you. Uh, that I actually, it's made it more difficult in some ways, especially over the summer, because it was easier when we worked directly with schools, and we were able to to teach the coding programs and uh, digital digital skills and other things that we've been doing. And now we had to shift into that um, a, a, a an online version of it. Um, but we were able to, so in 2020, um, it took a lot of groundwork and believe it or not, even more partners, because you can't just blast out that you're offering something. You, you think that it would, more people would log on, but you have to be more surgical in terms of who you're trying to help. So um, we were able to do that. But what we found as well was that all of a sudden we had a, we had a class, some teacher in Jamaica told their friends and we ended up having 500 kids from Jamaica from like 10 different classrooms logging on and learning along with the kids that we were working with in the Rio Grande Valley um, wow. along with anyone else that wanted to log on. So those opportunities um, made us rethink how we're doing everything. Everything we do now is going to be an amalgam of the, of the two. Um, so if we're physically in a classroom, and we didn't do this before, if we're physically in a classroom teaching or working at a, a center, a community center, if we're doing it with adults, and especially English learners and others, we will have a camera there and be blasting it out to anyone that wants to log in. The other thing is that the digital platform has created an opportunity for us to, to create content and to capture that content so that then we can share it on an ongoing basis. If you're physically in a room with 25 people in Newark, somebody in San Jose isn't going to be able to see it. Now we have that opportunity to do that too. Um, the beauty is that curriculum is all over the place. For, for All we do is adapt something that already exists. Somebody really smart put something together um, and just didn't have anyone that was going to be able to use it. So the, the benefit to them is that we're able to use it and adapt it to what we're doing. So to adapt it to a digital platform um, has not been that difficult. You, you just need the, the right trainers. The, that's the other thing too, is that you have to adjust to how that is being taught. If you're not physically in front of someone, it better be very typed. It better be much more engaging. You think that it'd be less engaging because you're in a digital. No, you have to really, um, you can't be monotone when you're teaching someone. You have to make it as exciting. You have to connect with individuals as much as possible. Use use mm -hmm. the chats. Um, and so you, it, but there's a way of doing it. Now, in terms of the, the, the funding side of things, our expenses went down considerably last year. And we had mm -hmm. the best year that we've had in a very long time, simply because we were able to do everything digitally. And what I found too is that... Um, 2020 gave us the opportunity to do things. My, my team had been suggesting this for many years, and I was like, our sponsors aren't going to go for it. They'll think we're being cheap. Um, the people that are learning aren't going to go for it. They're going to think that, you know, hey, I can do this anywhere and just go online on YouTube and find other stuff. No, you can still have a personal touch, but we're able to reach more people than we were before for less money. So what that's done, um, my friend, is that we've been able to launch programs without any funding behind it simply because we needed to support wow. these communities. And we've always been bold about that anyway. In fact, our Code of Second Language program was launched without any money, and then it started coming in. So we've always believed in building the bridge as we cross it um, because we're impatient, like I've been proselytizing. But I, I do think that in this space, you're able to deliver programs, create new programs, and execute them, even if it's as a pilot. We're now doing... Um, this work in Latin America, we we just did it in Panama with a with an orphanage in Panama, that was also being seen by others, and and so it's allowed us to go into areas we never would have gone into, and there was no budget for it, we just wanted to do it, and this allows us to just do stuff, 
that is necessary or sometimes just cool. Fantastic. Wow. Jessica, any, any uh, programs at the FCC for, for nonprofits by chance? Or? I want to just like have an amen for everything that Tony just said, because we, we make a mistake if we think of ourselves as having mm. in-person activity and virtual mm. activity mm. going forward. The world has permanently been changed. Everything is hybrid and that there will be opportunities to coordinate online, connect online, collaborate online, and we have to make sure they're available to as many people as possible. And I don't want us to limit ourselves thinking as we exit this pandemic that online is, is bad or second rate and in-person is um, premium and the gold standard in every circumstance. We gotta be ready to connect everyone for a range of these things. And um, getting 100% of us connected to broadband is part of that. Wonderful. Well, unfortunately we've run out of time. But I thank you so much. This has been an amazing panel, and this conversation is incredible. And we would love to continue these discussions. We do have, of course, um, another panel coming right up uh, immediately following this talks. And what you have to do is, um, when you when you come out, make sure you enter into the next panel at two twenty five, which is highlighting community based approaches to digital skilling. Um, thanks again to our insightful panelists. You guys were amazing, and thank you for all these great ideas. I know this is going to be very, very helpful to so many of the organizations that are partnering with us. Looking forward to the next panel and please, please stay tuned if you can. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Adios. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.